I'm Nancy Hawk, and I'm the Executive Director of Basic Rights Oregon. Basic Rights Oregon has been fighting for LGBTQ equality in our state since 1996, and we're not stopping now. No virus can stop us. And um, we are um, really excited um, tonight. We're going to talk about meeting some of our basic needs. Um, we're at a really interesting and really difficult for a lot of people, hard time in our community um, right now. And um, so we're gonna get started with introductions um, in a moment, um, but I just wanna first thank um, our live captioners who are making tonight's town hall accessible. And um, yeah, and let's talk a little bit about what's happening. So we know that the LGBTQ community, that um, there's so many of us who work in the service industry who may have lost jobs in the last six weeks or um, who are in poverty already before the crisis began. And so um, it feels like our community has been pretty hard hit um, by what's happening. And so tonight we're really focusing on those basic needs around access, accessing food, having safe housing, and your rights on the job. And so we have a small but mighty group of amazing guests tonight, and I'm gonna allow people to introduce themselves. And um, I'll do my usual thing, which is going alphabetical by first name. And I'm gonna ask people to start off by sharing their name and their pronouns, what your job is, and maybe one thing that surprised you in a good way um, about spending so much time at home. And I'm gonna start with Becky from the Oregon Law Center. Hey everyone, my name is Becky Strauss. I'm a staff attorney with the Oregon Law Center. The Oregon Law Center is a statewide legal services organization. We provide free legal services to low-income Oregonians. My practice is in housing law. I represent tenants and people experiencing homelessness in landlord-tenant or discrimination or other cases. My pronouns are she and her. Um, I think I had to, was thinking of something that surprised me maybe outside of the home. Um, I was pleasantly surprised to see how the, the governor and the state um, acted quickly on housing protections and local governments across the state acted quickly on housing protections um, and that they've been very in tune to the needs of our clients and in, in trying to respond to those through this crisis. Um, at home, I've been pleasantly surprised to see my, my two and a half year old son's interest in gardening. So that's been, oh, that's been nice. That is nice. Um, Johnny? Hi, uh, I'm Johnny Shaver, he, him pronouns. I'm the client engagement developer for Oregon Food Bank. And um, something that has been surprising to me um, is how often my 11 year old uh, reads when left to their own devices. Um, so that's been pretty fantastic. That's great, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Hoyle. Hi, um, I'm Val Hoyle. I'm the Labor Commissioner for the State uh, Bureau of Labor and Industries. And what we do is we enforce the civil rights laws for the state. We enforce the wage and hour laws for the state, including prevailing wage. We certify the apprenticeship programs for the state. And we have a technical assistance for employers um, uh, division. So if you're an employer and you want to know about employment law, we want to help you do that. So, and with that on, on, on the line, in case I need to phone a friend, our Dylan Morgan, who oversees our um, employer technical assistance line, and also Carol Johnson, who oversees our um, civil rights division, um, who came to us, uh, eight, I think eight months ago from Arkansas, where she ran the Fair Housing um, Commission there. Um, so, Fair Housing Administration, and uh, I live in Springfield, just outside of Springfield, Oregon. And I guess the, and, and this is the first time since last year because my main office is in Portland that I've been home for more than five days in a row. And my, my dog just hasn't known what to do with the fact that we're home. And the thing that's most surprising is um, I really got to find out, um, I live in a rural community, what our local farms are growing. So we've been keeping in touch and sort of sharing food and food tips. So we're able to, I, I have a great privilege to be able to 
eat fresh, eat local, and have a whole lot of kale. So I'm, I'm learning <laughs> recipes with kale. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Um, I'll share one thing that surprised me in the past week is how motivating Pokemon Go is to make <laughs> a child want to go outside. Um, he's six years old and we just catch Pokemon for like two hours a day now. Um, morning Pokemon, evening Pokemon, it's a lot of Pokemon. Um, but yeah, hot tip, Pokemon Go um, for your kindergartners. Um, so the way tonight's going to work is I'm going to start off by asking some questions and then the majority of questions will come from YouTube Live and from Facebook Live. I guess YouTube isn't called live anyway, um, from YouTube and Facebook and people will write in their questions and then I'll ask them. And um, but yeah, we'll, we'll just get started with a conversation because I think that we are living in times um, that none of us have ever could have ever foreseen. And um, a lot has changed in our work and what we're doing and how we're doing it. So I'm gonna start um, with Val um, and Commissioner Hoyle. Um, I just first wanna thank you. Uh, his bully has long stood with the LGBTQ community um, in enforcing our civil rights. Um, I think most famously, there was the Sweet Cakes by Melissa case where um, the bakery tried to deny um, a wedding cake couple and Bully really stood with our community and we will always appreciate that. And I think that, um, can you just talk to us a little bit about some of the changes and some of the shifts you've had to make at Bully with the changes that have been happening? So I think the best person to talk about that is Carol Johnson. Um, she is uh, one of the things I, I knew that coming in to lead this agency is that unlike uh, Brad Vakian, I'm not an attorney. So I wanted to make sure that I had an attorney um, who was well experienced in civil rights to run that part of the agency. And um, Carol has, uh, Carol Johnson has really focused on making sure that we're able to address customers' needs and um, as much as possible and that we're outreaching throughout the state. So I, I think I would ask Carol to speak to what they've been dealing with uh, right now. Hello, special guest, Carol Johnson. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Good evening. Um, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner um, and, and, and the rest of you all. Um, so, yeah, I've been here a whole eight months now, so it's been pretty exciting. Um, and also to, to just be um, here in Oregon around this time, it's um, definitely um, a tremendous experience. We have um, done a lot in the eight months that, that I have been here and, and then um, I guess over a year now that the commissioner has been at the helm um, of Oregon Labor and Industries um, and really have um, just dug into trying to make some, um, some, some improvements and we've got a great team, a great uh, group of investigators who are really um, devoted to the mission of civil rights and enforcing protections and you know, and that that's going to include housing and employment and, you know, all of those areas um, that are very important to all of us in this room and those of us that are listening. So we we've got a great team. I'm excited about it. Um, I'm really um, impressed with Commissioner Hoyle and the things that she's done. Um, and I'm, I'm just happy to be part of the team. So and, and what are we what are we hearing about COVID? What is our agency hearing about COVID? So um, we have, so the first week that um, we started our re remote work, we are almost 100%, I guess, now working remotely um, and still serving um, uh, the, the needs of the, the people who were calling in. Uh, that first week, we had probably around 540 some odd cases or calls of complaints that people called in. You know, every call that we that we get in doesn't necessarily materialize into an actual civil rights complaint. Um, sometimes people just have questions or concerns about what they may be seeing or things that may be happening either with their housing or their employment. Um, and so um, right now we are we're tracking those cases. We are trying to get those calls um, uh, returned and, and calls made. And um, we've had, I think right now we're up to, I think it's around 400 calls that we have had um, that we think may materialize into something. We don't know what. 
Um, but we're we're at those numbers right now. But again, we're we're really trying to um, get the immediate needs met, get the questions answered. Um, you know, and, and again, those are dealing with everything from you know how do I deal with housing issues um, to uh, what about leave issues, and you know can I take off for this, and you know will this qualify, um, and you know what about my job and, you know, how am I going to, you know, and those basic things, how, how am I going to feed my family if, um, if, you know, I'm, I'm let go or if, you know, there's, there's an issue there. So, I mean, we're just trying to, again, we're trying to go through all of those calls and make sure that we answer questions and um, give folks as much a sense of security as we can. And also to let them know that we are here. We're processing complaints. Uh, we're all working uh, very hard to do that and very diligently, but it's, it's a lot, you know, yeah. Yeah, it sounds like there's a large variety of kinds of calls um, people have been calling in with. And then, um, yeah, so thank you for that. And I imagine we'll ask you to chime in again um, as we keep going. Um, so, um, so, yeah, so Carol mentioned just feeding our families, meeting our basic needs. And I know that Oregon Law Center, your mission is, as lawyers, is to help people meet their basic needs and uh, make sure people have everything they need. Um, and right now, when a lot of people have lost work and are struggling or anticipating struggling um, how to make their rent or mortgage payments, what advice, um, Becky, do you have to offer folks who are in that position of struggling around rent or mortgage? Sure, I, mean, I can provide a little bit of information about some of the protections that are in place now for people who are struggling. Um, I'll focus more on the renter protections, um, but we'll touch on the protections for people who do own their homes and might be facing foreclosure on, uh, because of these circumstances. Briefly, what, what's in place statewide is an order from the governor that says that during this state of emergency, no one can be evicted who um, can't pay their rent. And um, those protections extend a little bit beyond just people who can't pay their rent, but also people um, who might get an eviction without cause. Um, it's, a, it's an extra protection to make sure that, that landlords don't try to circumvent the non-payment protections by simply giving a, a no cause eviction. So what we have in place is a statewide order from the governor that says that people who cannot pay their rent during this time cannot be evicted. Um, as well, the order says that people cannot be charged late fees um, for this time when they're not able to pay rent. And, and that um, that's important because those tend to build up and, and provide a barrier to catching up later if those are being charged. Um, what the governor's order also says is that tenants should give reasonable notice to their landlords um, when they know they're not going to be able to pay. Um, most tenants have a have a good working relationship with their landlord and can provide that notice to the landlord um, and try to work something out. Um, it should be clear that even though the governor's order is in place about not um, renters not being able to be evicted during this time, it doesn't mean that rent is not going to be owed later. Um, it's not a rent forgiveness program. It's just a um, a prohibition or a moratorium on a landlord's right to evict for non-payment. So tenants should be thinking about um, if they can make partial payments, the order encourages tenants to make partial payments if they can um, pay what they can toward rent, and then obviously be thinking about um, what they can do to catch up later. The, the state and of course the federal government are working on trying to um, allocate resources to um, communities that need, that need that most to be able to access rent assistance to help them pay the rent once the state of emergency is over. So those are the, um, that's the basic overview of the renter protections. Uh, there are some protections for people, as I said, related to uh, a moratorium around foreclosure. Those protections are federal level protections. They're not state protections. So um, what those federal protections say is that for people who have um, federally backed mortgages, they cannot be foreclosed on for 60 days. So if, if unless that gets extended, that's that's currently through the state of emergency, no foreclosures can be initiated. Thank you for that. Um, so um, 
talking about work, talking about housing, and of course the most basic need is to feed ourselves every day. And I think that um, it's, yeah, it's challenging for a lot of folks. And I think there was a lot of food insecurity in our state before this crisis happened, but I know that the it's been a, quite a changing landscape with Oregon Food Bank. Um, Johnny, can you tell us a little bit about the increase in usage in the last several weeks and um, just what's been happening there and how are you managing? Yeah, um, so we don't have specific numbers. Uh, agencies report monthly and um, as wild as it seems, it's only been about four to five weeks since all this started. Um, so uh, the other thing that's true is the folks working the pantries are also the ones who do the reporting. So um, uh, that's been a little bit slower than uh, usual, but we'll have the number soon. What we can tell you is that um, food banks across the country have uh, reported a 40 to 60 percent increase. And while we don't have exact numbers, we know that uh, we are seeing increased numbers um, at a significant amount of pantries. Um, <clears throat> food is available though. Uh, one thing about Oregon is that because of our access to resources, we have not been hugely hit in terms of um, pantries closing. There have been some closures, but those have been pretty limited. Um, often it's uh, smaller organizations that are um, run by folks who fall into high risk categories. Um, but again, that's been a pretty limited number of closures. Um, and our website, oregonfoodfinder.org is updated twice a day to reflect any closures. What we're seeing more of though is um, shifts in time where places are open. Uh, they're often expanding hours um, or uh, increasing the number of days that they're able to be open. Um, so that's been really good. Uh, we're taking a lot of um, social distancing measures. We have a pretty active volunteer, like repacking big bulk food sort of setup at Oregon Food Bank. And where we used to have a hundred or more people volunteering, we now have a maximum of 10 per shift. Um, so we've had to do a lot of shifting how the work gets done. Um, but it's, we're making it work. We have a hold right now on um, consumer-based donations, so food drives. So um, we're shifting to purchasing more food uh, versus doing those sort of um, consumer-based donations. So food is still available. Uh, and one thing that's it's uh, the timing is great, I guess. Great's the wrong word. Um, but uh, in the last month, at the end of March, um, Oregon Food Bank for a while, at least the last year, has been advocating to increase the income requirements for food pantries. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And so uh, those uh, requirements had been the same as SNAP with at 185% of um, FPL, the federal poverty line limit. I'm not sure. Um, but we increased those in Oregon. So now families making or individuals making up to 300% of FPL qualify for income restricted food pantries. Um, so the timing on that was ideal as we go into a pandemic. Again, wrong word. I'm not choosing the right <laughs> words. You're doing fine. <laughs> well, you know, there's no right words for right now. Right. So that's sort of the landscape of food. Uh, yeah, we have food. We're having to figure out new ways to get it. And I work with a lot of amazing people who are making that happen. Um, so yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you for that. Um, so just jumping around a little bit so that everyone gets a chance to talk about um, some of their work. Um, I'll go back to Bowley and I know that um, we've heard a lot and we had questions um, in previous town halls around 
um, lack of personal protective equipment, especially for retail workers. And that's come up um, just a lot. Um, and people being concerned about businesses still being open and feeling like forced to work in really sort of crowded conditions with limited access or the expectation that if they do use PPE, that they provide it themselves. Um, does Bully have any rules about that? Um, Technically, no. Um, that would be OSHA, um, which is uh, Occupational Safety and Health um, Agency, I think. Um, but we get so many calls. So technically, no, because OSHA oversees worker safety in the workplace. However, if you report that you have an unsafe working condition to OSHA and your employer retaliates against you, we then take on that case. That's a violation. And we are being very, very active in, as uh, Carol Johnson said, we are being very, very active in making sure that we're enforcing that law. We want any worker to know that if they complain that they're not safe and their employer retaliates in any way, we're there, we're working from home, and we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna defend them and we're gonna prosecute because people need to be able to know that they're safe. The other thing is because we have taken the approach that there's no wrong door in government and right now, right now people have a lot of questions and they don't know the difference between the Bureau of Labor and Industries and OSHA and the Department of Employment. So what we did was on our website, we made it so that people can file an OSHA complaint because a lot of people come to us. So we, we actually have a form on our website, the, uh, the Bureau of Labor and Industries website that you can find on Oregon.gov um, so that you can fill out that application. We will get it to OSHA. But again, if you feel retaliated against, if you feel that you're, you're, you're being harmed in any way because you um, spoke up, we're going to be there for you. I finally will say my, my son is a grocery worker. Um, he works at Fred Meyer and he's a member of UFCW. And what we have seen, whether it's um, in the building trades um, or in, uh, you know, in grocery workers or it's in healthcare, that those workers who are members of a union, this really shows the union difference because it's not just their voice, but a larger voice. And finally, I will say that um, OSHA and our office is working in strong um, collaboration. We work very closely with OSHA to monitor those cases that come in through us. We have a great working relationship with them. Again, we want to make sure there's no wrong door to government. So if you come to us, we'll make sure that that com complaint gets handled. That's great to know. Thank you, Val. Um, and. Becky, when you were talking about the um, the eviction moratorium, um, one thing that we've heard is that some tenants are having trouble showing the documentation about how they've been um, financially impacted by the COVID-19 crisis, or they feel like their landlords are unresponsive or uncooperative. Do you have any advice to folks who might be in that position where it feels less clear than like, there's a pandemic, we have to lay everyone off. Here's your paperwork that's beautifully filled out. <laughs> All the dates, exactly correctly. Um, well, the, the good news is that this now is an opportunity to um, clear up what the law actually says. Um, there is no documentation requirement for mm -hmm. tenants. Um, at some point before the governor's order, um, some local governments had started with their own uh, eviction moratoria, including um, Multnomah County, Beaverton, I believe, maybe Hillsboro. And I think some of those did have a documentation requirement. Um, the governor's order supersedes those. And, and um, since that time, Multnomah County, at least, I'm not sure about the other jurisdictions, has revised its eviction moratorium to get rid of the documentation requirement. I agree that was becoming very burdensome for tenants to figure out what documentation they needed, how could they access it, was it adequate? Um, so fortunately they do not have to do that anymore either to benefit from the protections um, from the state or from whatever unique or stronger protections might exist in their local area. Um, I should note, I would recommend to tenants um, 
to go ahead and double check if um, if your local city or county provides stronger protections than the state provides. Um, as far as I know, at this point, they're generally the same in terms of the specifics of what's um, of what's outlined, except that the um, penalties for landlords are different. Um, in Multnomah County, for example, there's a there's an explicit money penalty for landlords who violate the the moratorium at the state. It's a criminal penalty. There's not a money damages. So mm -hmm. um, it, it, it would be helpful for tenants to take a look in your local area to see if there's a unique special protection above and beyond what the governor's order provides. Um, but fortunately, tenants do not have to provide documentation to prove that they any loss of income is due to COVID or to prove that they've lost income at all or to prove that they're having difficulty paying rent, uh, none of those things. So that is good. Um, your other question was about landlords that may be um, unresponsive and, and maybe that was kind of in the context of right. um, providing documentation. So um, I hope that, that that eases some concerns from the tenant perspective. Yeah, that's Wonderful, thank you. Um, so it feels like there's a lot of sort of new rules and new laws like um, around, you know, some great protections as um, Becky mentioned, the state moved really quickly to protect people from being evicted. But we also know that some people might be newly accessing services for the first time um, because they've never been in this position before. Um, so do you, I think across the board, I feel like it'd be great to hear some advice for people. Maybe I'll start with the food bank, like someone's never accessed the food bank before. What do they need to know about um, how to get help if they're newly, say, unemployed? Yeah, so um, something that's important, um, given the sort of income restrictions I mentioned before, is that those restrictions are in this minute. Uh, what is your income right now? It's not last month or last year, it's right now. Um, and it's also a self-declaration. There's never proof of income required at a food bank or food pantry. Um, and all of your civil rights apply at a food pantry, which is um, something that I, not a lot of folks know or um, has come up a lot for me and my work with clients. Um, so that's a, a big one. And I think that um, checking the OregonFoodFinder.org to find the pantry or program that's near you, uh, something that we find often is that people go to the pantry that is recommended to them, um, which is great, but often they're coming from like Clackamas into Multnomah County and passing uh, like half a dozen other great programs that um, they could be accessing. So just checking uh, the website, like I said, it's being updated twice a day right now to reflect changes. Um, and we have different kinds of programs. Uh, if you don't meet the income re um, requirements for a pantry, uh, we have free food markets uh, where you get produce and staples and those are no barrier food options. Um, there's also a lot of programs. There's a lot of mutual aid efforts. Um, when I'm not working at the food bank, um, I'm on the admin team for the PDX COVID-19 mutual aid network. We do home deliveries of food boxes. Um, and there's other efforts similar to that happening. Um, Meals on Wheels has expanded their eligibility to anyone over 60. Um, yeah. And a lot of those resources can be found on the food bank's website, the OregonFoodFinder.org. Thanks. And sort of on the same vein, I feel like there's a lot of folks who are facing unemployment for the first time and might be, say, struggling to get that last paycheck from their um, now former employer or have other issues like that. Is that something that Bully can speak to? Absolutely. Um, we actually have gotten quite a few of these um, complaints, specifically as um, the shelter in place order came in. Um, we got a lot of calls from people who said, my employer paid me part of my wages, but not all of them. And they said they were going to hold them back. That is illegal. And 
we will absolutely um, fight for you to get your wages. So uh, you, your employer must pay your wages in full. There are no exception. And if you're laid off, you must receive all the wages you've earned by your next regularly scheduled payday after the layoff. So if your employee, employer has a policy of paying out vacation time, you also must receive that in full at that time as well. So, um, and, and we also have something else um, that was put into place when a lot of the mills were closed. If your company goes out of business, and, and we may start seeing this, um, and they haven't paid you your paycheck, we have what's called the wage security fund. So we can actually pay you up to $10,000 um, of back wages. Um, and so that's something that's available, but by all means, contact us if you're not getting paid, you have to get paid. Thank you um, for that. And um, so, it feels like there's there are things available and there are services available, but it also feels like no matter what we do and what we try to set up, there's violators out there. <laughs> um, and um, I know just from like looking at social media a lot and especially um, the LGBTQ groups in Oregon, it feels like I've seen numerous people talk about getting served eviction notices um, despite the order. Um, Becky, can you talk a little bit about um, what people should do if they're served an eviction notice during this time? Sure. Um, so the, the first thing I'll say is that um, OregonLawHelp.org is a great resource for um, legal information about these housing protections. It also has information about all the other areas of law that our attorneys practice, including issues around food security, employment and wages, um, a lots of really helpful explainer documents about all of these things. So I would encourage people to go visit that. Um, in the housing section on Oregon Law Help, we also have sample letters to landlords. We recommend that as a first step for people who um, know that their landlord is doing something that's not lawful um, with COVID issues or any time. Start with um, getting educated about your own rights. And oftentimes we do have sample letters to communicate with your landlord in writing uh, with a date on it. Keep a copy for yourself to initiate that communication. Um, if that doesn't go anywhere unique to this situation, I think there are a few other things that I'll add. Um, Chief Justice Walters of the Oregon Supreme Court has issued a, a, um, an order herself that, um, among many other things related to other areas of law, has put a delay on eviction cases for this state of emergency. So for people who are receiving eviction notices from their landlord, that's concerning, that's illegal, that's very intimidating, and many people may move out not knowing their rights. But all of that said, those eviction cases will not be processed right now because eviction cases are not moving forward in Oregon courts right now. Um, so that's um, a bit of a backstop and an extra protection. In addition, for those cases that um, have already worked their way through the eviction court system, the governor's order prohibits law enforcement from going out um, to do lockouts after the end of those cases. Um, so those those tenants are protected, at least through this state of emergency. Um, finally, I think if if um, all else fails, we hope that people are able to access uh, legal representation if they need it. So um, for people who are income eligible, they can apply for services with Oregon Law Center or, or Legal Aid Services of Oregon or can re refer to the Oregon State Bar directory to try to find an attorney to help them. And I'll also say um, at the Bureau of Labor and Industries in our Civil Rights Division, we also, um, as, as part of the work that we do, um, we will enforce uh, fair housing laws and um, will uh, absolutely defend people who have been discriminated against in housing for any of the protected classes. So for race, 
for um, gender orientation, sexual orientation, um, gender identification, any of those things, we will do that. And what you should know with our office, and if, if, you, if, if you're being discriminated against because of a disability, any public accommodation um, needs to be accessible to you. So an important part um, aspect of what we do is that there are no income requirements um, for you to apply for, for the Bureau of Labor and Industries to help. Um, and there's no citizen requirements either. So um, that's, I think that's really important because right now people who are not documented um, are afraid to access government assistance. And one of the things that, that we can do in our office is we can protect people's identity um, when we move forward, either with a commissioner's complaint or, um, you know, again, we're not going to check your identification. We're not going to check your citizenship. Um, we're just there to make sure that you have representation if you've been discriminated against. Thank you, Thank you for that. And um, I just wanted to open it up in case anybody else had anything on that topic as far as um, working with folks who are undocumented, um, whether it's around housing or access to food. Yeah, I did want to just say that um, free food programs, uh, no, food banks are not part of the public charge rule change. Um, so accessing pantries um, won't account uh, against folks. Um, also, your the information you disclose to a pantry uh, is only accessible to that pantry in the Oregon Food Bank and has a lot of um, confidentiality requirements that go along with it and we won't be giving up anyone's information without a fight. Thank you. Becky, is this something that's come up at Oregon Law Center around people who are undocumented, um, maybe losing their housing or fighting to keep their housing and how um, citizenship might come up? I know sometimes people get threatened around their citizenship status. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right in the ways that you identify people who don't have um, a certain legal status are more vulnerable to um, bad actor behavior, um, maybe are more vulnerable to threats, um, but the, the laws protect everyone equally. The, um, the laws don't have any exceptions for for legal status. So um, everyone should be able to avail themselves of the protections that are available under state law um, and of the legal services that are available to them when they're eligible. Um, and then it, feel, it felt like, Becky, that you were um, sort of saying that <laughs> if someone's served an eviction notice during this time, they should stay in their houses. That's the advice I was hearing. <laughs> <laughs> that is the advice that I'm giving. Um, okay. Um, you know, at, at no time, regardless of, of um, a global pandemic, are landlords able to um, carry out what we call self-help evictions. If a landlord wants to take possession back of the property, that landlord has to go through the lawful process to do so, starting with a notice to the tenant um, a proper notice with the proper timeline, and then going through the court process through the courts um, to ultimately get a court order to take back possession of the property. Um, so so um, landlords are, are not going to be able to do that currently. Um, tenants should figure out what their specific situation is and what their rights are, but absolutely tenants should not move right now, even if they can't pay the rent. Thanks for that. Um, so we are starting to get questions um, in from people who are watching. Um, one, there's the first one I'm seeing is around housing and wondering if there's affordable housing options, maybe a uh, public housing similar to section eight, but that doesn't require that people fill in a M or F gender marker. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, maybe, um maybe the folks from um, Basic Rights Oregon know this. Um, never encountered that question, honestly. I mean, I could think about whether there would be um, 
some implications in terms of um, the, the issues that Commissioner Hoyle raises around protected classes and discrimination. Um, there are legal theories around um, uh, the, the impact of, of particular policies, even if they're not explicitly discriminatory, what impact might they have um, in terms of a discriminatory policy. But um, it's, it's not an issue that I've thought about before, so I'm not sure I would give a, a black and white answer, but I appreciate it being raised. Thanks. Um, I will say that it's come up, it came up a bunch last week and in previous calls around, um, like, sorry, <coughs> a real call, real live, real cough. Um, but um, that a lot of federal programs um, require M or F um, gender marker. It's not the state of Oregon. And <coughs> that generally people should still apply. You are who you are and, um, and that you should access the services that you need. And, um, and that I know for a lot of um, services, you know, or at least, you know, things like you're filling out the census, right? Like no one's gonna double check your other documents. You know, you fill out what's possible now and you know we're working to change things as much as possible um, to make things better for everybody and to have more options and have more choices. But it feels it sucks when that's the those are the only options, and it's really hard for folks. And so I think that it's we know that it makes you feel like the services aren't for you, but you should still be able to access those services that you need, um, no matter um, if they have not if they haven't caught up to who you are. Um, and then there's a question specific for Boley asking about unemployment. And I know that's not exactly what you cover, but um, you know, someone wrote in with concern about just how the disparities because of how heavily the LGBTQ community works in food service and other um, retail um industries um if there's any sense of unemployment among the lgbtq community and where oregon is in terms of lgbtq unemployment and i know that's probably not possible for you to answer yeah we um i we don't oversee the department of employment and um so we don't have those numbers. The other thing is that we've got a, a it, we have 109 people in our agency, so it's pretty small. And, um, you know, over the past 40 years has been cut a lot. So we don't have policy analysts, we don't have economists, we aren't, we, we are small and mighty, but um, we also, we just don't have access. Having said that, um, as I said previously, um, we, anybody who has an issue who's been discriminated against who feels like their wages haven't been paid um, they should absolutely contact us and the other piece of information that we've been giving out um, because the and again I'm, I'm sorry I'm answering a different question I don't know the answer to that question I'm going to answer a different question so um, for those people who have applied for unemployment and haven't gotten a response um, the Department of Employment usually gets about 5,000 applications for unemployment a week. In the past four weeks, they've gotten over 300,000 applications for unemployment. They have quadrupled their staff. Their staff is working on Saturdays as well as all week, but they're still behind. So if you have a question about an unemployment claim, then you should email them. That's the best way to get a hold of them. Email. OED, like Oregon Employment Department, OED underscore COVID-19 underscore info at Oregon.gov. So OED underscore COVID-19 underscore info at Oregon.gov. Thank you for that. And um, I'll say that we, um, yeah, there's just a lot of questions that we get around statistics around the LGBTQ community. And um, 
there's estimates available, but like they're basically impossible to get that are really accurate. Um, there's especially when you go look at specific communities, you know, I think unless we're doing it ourselves. So there's like, um, you know, the US trans survey that happened in 2015. Oregon did an awesome job showing up. Um, we actually crashed their server on the first day it was available. Um, and, you know, and they're going to try to do it again um, this year, but it just feels like, you know, the um, that's an LGBT organization, right, that put that forward. And so we have some data from there, but in general, we're not, um, there's not a lot of information about us, right? And um, I think even in the census, for instance, right, we're only you're only being counted as LGBTQ if you live with uh, your same sex partner. Um, and, you know, and there's only M or F as gender marker. So, you know, I think that, uh, you know, people are always confounded that I don't know how many LGBTQ people exactly live in Oregon, but there's honestly no way for me to really know. So um, it's just interesting. Um, it always comes up. <laughs> um, and yeah. Um, and then we had another specific question, and this one is for Commissioner Hoyle, um, but someone works at a place where people are carpooling to work, and they're really concerned about people's lack of um, social distancing, and the employer um, doesn't want to tell, so they brought this up with their employer, their employer doesn't want to tell people that they can't carpool. Um, and the person's asking, does the employer have the right to avoid telling people to carp not to carpool? Um, so it feels like a pretty specific conversation, but um, I don't know, does the employer have the right to ask people to keep socially distant? I think that that is difficult. And again, the key thing is for that employee um, to make sure that they feel safe and protected. Um, and if they feel like going to work is exposing them um, in a way that's not safe, they should absolutely um, report that to uh, OSHA or go to our website and uh, fill out the form. I think I would ask Dylan Morgan, um, who uh, oversees our technical assistance for employers to answer that question. Special guest, Dylan Morgan, hello. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm making an appearance. Good evening, everyone. So, um, interesting question, and it's it's certainly one that we've we've never gotten before. Uh, I would think, off the top of my head, that an employer certainly has the right and obligation to provide a safe and healthful workplace. Um, but I think that's the workplace. If there are folks who are deciding to carpool um, or, or do other things really uh, outside of, of work. Um, I'm not sure where an employer is going to be able to say legally, uh, you know, you can do this off hours and you can do that off hours, uh, but you can't come to work afterwards or, or something along those lines. So a complicated question. I, I would think we'd want more information, uh, but what I will do is, is make a shameless plug here in a position like this. Um, so for, for those of you who are employers on this call, this, this town hall, um, obviously, Boley is well known for going to bat for, for workers uh, on wage and hour complaints, uh, claims for unpaid wages, civil rights discrimination, housing accommodations in, in, in the public uh, sphere. But one of the other less well-known things about Boley is that we do take a really proactive stance with employers. And we do try and get them the information they need to navigate things like this, questions like this, uh, get the law in front of them that, that is helpful for them to make a good business decision and not wrong foot it. If we can prevent um, a scenario from coming up where people are uh, finding themselves discriminated against or you know, there's a question about paycheck timing, there's all kinds of things that we can do to help employers to do the right thing and uh, to not create liability for themselves that they didn't need to. So uh, technical assistance for employers, uh, we're also on, on the web, oregon.gov slash boli slash TA, throw a technical assistance on the end of that, that TA, and you'll find us, FAQs, uh, website, mm -hmm. uh, website, our contact information. We're taking phone calls and emails, hundreds of them in the last couple of weeks, all around COVID kind of scenarios, and we'd be certainly happy to help 
uh, anybody on the call with, with questions that they may have, even if I don't have a solid answer to this, this particular question. That's great. Thank you, Dylan. Um, and I just want to just sit for a minute with this number of 300,000 people applying for unemployment and how heavy and big that feels um, because we're a small state and that's a significant percentage of our uh, working age population. And um, I know it's showing up in lots of different ways around your increase in calls at Bully, around people who need housing assistance. Um, and yeah, I just, I don't know. I know we've talked a little bit already about the newly unemployed, but it feels like <laughs> this could have re repercussions for quite a while. And um, the economy is changing. Um, and we don't know what businesses are going to open or not um, after this is done. And yeah, I don't know if folks just want to share a little bit about some of their thinking and how they've been sort of dealing with this. Um, what I will say is, um, as, as we come back, I, I, I have to say one of the things that we've done as an agency is it's caused us to look at all of our processes um, as we've shifted to having people work at home and being accessible in that way. So um, there will be a benefit in how we transition to a less paper heavy workflow and and look at all of our procedures with fresh eyes but the other piece i guess warning that i would say is that we are an income based income tax based uh budget in our state so when less people are working there are less taxes that come in to fund the services that people who are out of work really need and living in a rural community i can tell you that um, it, it isn't, you know, it, it, people here sometimes feel like it's, it's, they hear about what's happening in the metro areas, but it is just devastating for people who are just living on the edge. So throughout our state, this is going to have a great impact. But when we go back into 2021 to fill in these budget holes, we're going to have a big budget hole. And for all of those programs that are funded by the lottery, remember, that's closed down as well. So I think that we need to think about that going forward as there's less money going around, there also will be less services. So we need to make sure that we're advocating for those things that really matter and that we have that safety net, but understand there will be less, less resources available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just the amount of unemployment our state's paying, the number of people who are going on the Oregon Health Plan, it feels like our systems as they are, are being quite taxed um, at the moment. And uh, Becky or Johnny, do you have, do you wanna weigh in? Um, I guess I would just add that, um, you know, the legal services community, we're, we are doing our best to um, <laughs> respond in the way we've always responded and provide services in the way we've always provided services, which is to hear from our client community and hear from Oregonians about how this is affecting um, individuals and families in all areas, not just landlord tenant, um, and try to be um, responsive to, the, to that, try to advocate for that, and try to do our best to educate Oregonians about what the protections are and, and how they can avail themselves of those protections and, and provide representation and um, and legal counsel to those um, Oregonians when we can. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanna, um, I've already said it, but food is available if you need it. Um, there are a lot of resources that are um, harder to come by right now. Rent assistance is hard to come by, bill assistance. Um, we recognize those things as root causes of hunger. Um, but right now food is available. So if you need it, please reach out to the website or call the food bank. We've got client navigators who can help you navigate the services right now. Um, and uh, you mentioned that it's really hard to find statistics about uh, LGBTQ communities, um, but uh, the food bank has declared trans and gender non-conforming folks a priority constituent 
Um, and before the pandemic, I was doing a lot of work to figure out how to address um, hunger in trans community in the metro area. And so um, I would just look to OFB to be doing that work. Um, well, I'll be doing it virtually going forward, but um, I hope to be able to continue that work once we um, figure out what new normal looks like. That's great. Thank you. And I was wondering, Johnny, if you'd be willing to talk a little bit more about <clears throat> the mutual aid work that you're doing and how what's happening with that and how people can get involved. I know that um, I got to like pick up and deliver some handmade hand sanitizer um, from friends and get to deliver it to the women's shelter and family shelter. And it felt like honestly, the most useful thing I've done this month. Um, and so um, I know that it's possible for us to help each other um, during this crisis. Can you talk a little bit about the work you're doing there? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> one thing that's really true is that communities are showing up for each other. So uh, the mutual aid network, um, it kind of took off. And so we've got over 3,000 people have um, volunteered support. We've got nearly 2,000 requests for support. And so um, I was able to lean into my day job with the food bank uh, to create a food box system. Um, so we are doing nearly 300 um, food box deliveries to people's houses in the metro area every week. Um, and so that's been really fantastic. And we're also doing a one-to-one -one request so people can uh, request medication pickups. We're picking up people's glasses, whatever folks need. Um, we've raised a good bit of money for the network. And so um, we have about $50 uh, per request budgeted. So um, folks can request whatever it is they need help with. Um, and we'll try to make it happen. So um, yeah, uh, similar efforts are happening all over. Uh, I've been talking to folks in um, Ontario, Oregon about uh, the system and I've talked to folks actually in Springfield. Um, and um, yeah, there are small mutual aid efforts happening all over. There's also something called pod mapping that um, the mutual aid network here, the PDX COVID-19 mutual aid, mm -hmm. uh, and others, it's not our idea. It comes out of um, uh, some Bay Area social justice work. Um, but I believe the person's name is Mia Mingus. Um, it is mapping the resources that are physically close to you. Um, and there's a great video on the internet and oh, if you'll, I'm going to be making a short webinar for how to pod map food resources in your community soon. So, um, yeah, we have a lot of mutual aid work going on. And, um, you know, the metro area and Oregon in general have really been doing mutual aid work for a long time. Um, and so, uh, folks have really been able to shift gears. So in Portland, we have free hot soup and they give out hundreds of meals every week. They've been doing it for a decade or more. Um, and so those folks have really shifted and now they're doing mobile outreach um, to get food out. Um, so grassroots organizations are really leaning the mutual aid model of supporting each other. Um, and yeah, it's been really, lovely. It feels like my communities are flourishing in a time where it's kind of uh, not that way for everyone. That's great. That's really amazing. Um, and it feels like there's a lot of ways where community is coming together um, in really great ways. Val, do you want to talk a little bit since you live a little closer to rural Oregon um, than those of us in Portland just about things that you see happening in your community and how folks are, are coming together or like 
Um, just thinking about also, I know that a lot of times folks in rural communities tend to be more underemployed um, because of the lack of <laughs> jobs that maybe would take care of all, you know, use all of their skills available. So can you just talk a little bit about what it's like in your community where you actually live? I, I think um, so there's a there's there's a few things. One is um, what we have seen, whether it's, you know, here in in the Mid Valley or out in Eastern uh, Oregon, is that because our major newspapers have been either gone out of business or have been bought by national chains that don't focus on local news as much. Um, it's been difficult difficult to get news out there, right? So in, in the same way, there isn't the kind of local coverage that we used to have. And so in rural communities where people don't necessarily trust information, they feel like, well, is this really just a Portland problem? The other thing is rural poverty, poverty presents itself differently. People don't consider themselves as poor. And um, we lost a lot of the manufacturing jobs or whether it was timber jobs or things like that. So you, you have people who transition to making their money off of tourism. So when you lose three months of tourism, whether it's at the casino or it's from people coming to the coast or staying you know, in a hotel, um, that's it. You're not you're not making that money back. So people are really concerned and afraid. And then there also is culturally people who haven't applied for unemployment before have, feel like they want to go out that they're hardworking and they and they're embarrassed at having to apply for public assistance, which is what how they see unemployment. So we've really been trying to get the word out that this really is about protecting our neighbors. This really is about staying at home, that unemployment is something you paid for and that you, you are entitled to. Um, and then the one thing I can say living in a rural community is that people really do look out for each other, um, but it's it's scary times. And what, what I've heard most of all from people is that they're really afraid that they're gonna miss the, the tourist season, that it's not gonna come back and they really don't have the resources to make it through, whether it's a small craft brewery or it's a it's a hotel or it's a restaurant. I mean, they make the majority of their money in those three or four months. So we're gonna have to think about that when we backfill and we think about how, how do we keep these people going and what kind of opportunities do we have for people to get on their feet and, and have that safety net. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And then, um, Johnny, is there, um, it feels like we hear a lot about resources from the food bank in Portland, but I know that the food bank operates all over the state. Can you talk a little bit about like some access to food in rural areas and how that works? Yeah, uh, the Oregon Food Bank Network has uh, 21 regional food banks throughout the state. And so each of those food banks oversees um, food pantries in their areas. Um, so yeah, food is getting out. We, um, under normal operating sy systems times, uh, we go through about um, 2 million pounds of food a week throughout the OFB network. And I know that that is increased um, some 40 plus percent so we'll have more numbers about that soon but um yeah the food is getting out to the regional food banks so um they do have that we are aware that transportation in rural communities is a problem um we've been uh the different regional food banks uh are working on those things that uh, in their own areas, um, but we recognize that that is a barrier to access um, that still needs to be uh, a better resource and checked out. But food is all over the state and it will continue to be uh, going to all 21 regional food banks. So food is available if folks are able to get to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will say that yeah. even rural, um, 
home delivery has increased. There's a lot more home deliveries happening across the state. That's and great to hear. Val, did you want I to? I also um, want to uh, remind people about the invisible workers that we don't think about, especially in urban areas where you go to the grocery store and there's food on the shelves. Well, that food is grown by farmers and there are a lot of workers who um, work very hard and there's a large undocumented workforce that come in and work in brutal conditions. And in the housing, a lot of farm worker housing, um, it is impossible to social distance. So um, whether it's the immigration order or it's mm -hmm. what um, ICE is doing or it's people not being able to travel or undocumented workers not being eligible for a lot of the programs that other workers are eligible for. The bottom line is if you're an undocumented farm worker and you get sick, there is no safety net. And so when we think about how to take care of workers and we, when we think about who the essential workers are, I think we have to remember farm workers and when we, uh, I will just say hopefully soon get a different administration. Um, I, I think we need to remember who kept us fed during this time um, and make sure that those people are included, um, whether it's you know nurses or doctors, but our farm workers as well as our essential workforce. Yeah, and I will give a plug too for folks who are able and who have the financial means to think about folks who didn't get the stimulus check, who didn't get the $1,200. And um, I donated part of mine to Pekun, the Farm Workers Union, um, to help workers there. I think there's a lot of resources um, out there or a lot of places to donate if you have the capacity and the ability to do that. Um, because right now a lot of people are hurting because, um, because the system's not set up to support them. Right, and there's just a lot of ways where uh, folks, especially who are undocumented, especially people who um, even might not just have the right documents in the name that honors them um, and themselves, um, and they're having trouble accessing the resources that they need. And so I just feel like um, just really being thoughtful about the, you know, all of our community. So um, yeah, thanks for mentioning that, and then. Um, and I don't know, I know that Oregon Law Center has multiple offices and are there specific things folks should know? I know that like in more rural areas, there's not as many like so big apartment complexes. And so rental, you know, renters might be living more in individual houses, but um, have there been specific things that have come up around um, more rural Oregonians and struggles um, around housing? Um, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question. I mean, I think that we have at the law center, we have, um, offices in every part of the state. So every County is covered by our service area. Um, again, I'll make a plug for Oregon law help, which is um, something that, that everyone can access and then, um, go on there and find where your local office is if you're seeking legal assistance. But, um, I, I absolutely think that um, there are unique challenges in rural areas. I think in part, um, it's going to be an, an access to legal information issue, um, particularly on the part of small landlords who maybe aren't associated with a large association that's disseminating changes in the law to, to landlords um, who, who maybe just don't know that the law has changed. Um, a lot of landlords are struggling too. Um, and mm -hmm. so finding a way to, to make sure that everyone knows about some of the changes in the law and, and how the protections can help them and access some of the resources is going to benefit um, tenants as well. Great. Thanks. I had no idea that Oregon Law Center had offices all across the state like that. That's great information to know. And so everybody out there should be able to access an office. And then um, we got, we just got a question that I think is pretty interesting. Um, so at the beginning of the, of our program, <laughs> if you will, um, we, um, you were talking a lot about um, the moratorium on evictions and um, 
someone asked, would the state put in place a moratorium on paying rent during this crisis? Um, and it seems unlikely to me, but you know, um, do you wanna speak to maybe the difference between those things? Sure. Um, um, oh, I, I heard a little bit of feedback there. Um, yeah, I mean, to be perfectly candid, I think it's unlikely. Um, I don't think that there, I think that there's a benefit for um, people in their local community um, who are close to the impacts. Um, obviously this, this pandemic is impacting everyone, but who can really articulate the struggle that they're feeling um, as, as some of the struggles that they feel already are exacerbated during this pandemic. I think it's important for people to advocate for the things that they need and want and um, to say those things, even if they're not politically viable. I think they move the needle and, and make things that weren't politically viable um, into things that are. So um, in that way, I think it's helpful to advocate for things like that. Um, I, I think of it more as maybe a rent forgiveness um, order, um, but just at least kind of based on information that, that I'm aware of, I don't think that that's likely. I think that the more likely thing to happen is that um, there will be rent assistance resources for people. Um, admittedly, I don't think it's realistically going to be enough to meet the need. But um, what we're doing at our organization is, is trying to advocate for as much as possible, um, not just rent assistance, but funding to address some of the things that Commissioner Hoyle raises around farm worker and housing um, and, and farm workers' inability to be socially distanced right now. We're advocating that um, separate accommodations likely through hotels and motels be made for farm workers, similarly for people who are experiencing homelessness, a lot of local communities are working on that right now. Um, but I think um, from, from my perspective as someone who does casework and who also um, takes the experience of our clients to advocate at a policy level, it's helpful for us to hear those things and it's helpful for people to be talking about things like rent forgiveness um, because it gives us a sense of how people are truly experiencing the crisis and um, for lawmakers to hear those stories as well. Thank you for that. Um, and then we just got in two more questions. Um, and I don't know, I'm just gonna open them up because I don't know if this is anyone's area of expertise, um, but someone had a really specific question about SNAP benefits and if they um, apply for SNAP benefits now, they haven't received any unemployment and then they do start getting unemployment, will they have to pay back um, any of the SNAP benefits they received once they get an unemployment check? Or would they be in trouble somehow because right now they're at zero income, but then they'll have the income from unemployment? I'll just say, I, I don't know the answer to that person's specific question about their specific situation, but um, we do have a resource that's called the Oregon Public Benefits Hotline, and I can provide that number to everyone who's listening. That's great. Um, it's for people who have questions about their specific situation in, with regard to public benefits, um, including SNAP, health benefits, unemployment, et cetera. That's great. Thank you. Um, I can say it now or I can put it in the chat. What would be the easiest way to do um, that? If you say it, then it'll be um, in the live captioning. So. Oh, great. Okay, so it's 800-520-5292. Um, That's great. I am learning a lot about things that exist in our state that I didn't. <laughs> um, thank you for that. And then um, we have a question too about a lot of things like foodfinder.com, like our amazing um, services, but then uh, in a lot of rural areas, people might not have reliable internet service and so might um, need to um, rely more on things like call-in numbers or being able to call in resources because now they're not able to go to their libraries. Um, so just how are people getting the word out just about, you know, even being able to 
um, call your agencies um, for folks who might not have internet access or internet service that's reliable? I think one of the best resources is uh, 211, is dialing 211, which can help you find resources in your area. Um, and beyond that, you're right. I mean, we only got um, high speed internet in December, um, thanks to uh, Ron Wyden and Peter DeFazio and Jeff Merkley for really pushing um, for investment in rural broadband. And I will just say that after this, both as a job creation and because we've seen that high speed internet is an essential service, we absolutely need to invest in rural broadband. And my office has, we have an apprenticeship for that. Um, so uh, that needs to happen. But I think it's, you know, with our local communities, it's it's calling 211 and that will cover most of the state or at least um, get people uh, resources that they can call in their area. Uh, I'll say for the metro area, 211 uses OregonFoodFinder.org um, to help folks find food resources. Um, but for rural areas, we have a number you can call to get a navigator um, at OFB or I would reach out to your local regional food bank um, because they are directly connected to the food resources in your area and um, they're happy to do that navigation with you over the phone. That's great. It does feel like there are services available no matter where you are in the state and no matter how rurally you live, if you have access to being able to have a phone and call, you can get access to resources. But um, it's just about sharing information and really grateful for um, all the work you all are doing across the state. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left and I actually just wanted to leave a little bit of time for um, uh, maybe a funner question, thinking about um, Val's uh, comments before we started um, about you know, how are people just like um, doing this? Um, I feel like, especially this group, we all have um, kids at home. Um, and um, even if some of them are older, some of them are younger, but like we're um, all working, all trying to figure this out and how to remain like, you know, we all have big jobs of um, trying to help people and figure this out. And so just wondering like, um, one, you know, how people are doing and um, I'm learning a lot about kindergarten homework. It's fascinating. Um, and um, yeah, and just like, just a moment to check in and then um, in honor of Val, a favorite recipe maybe that you found in this time, because I know I am cooking a lot. I don't feel like I have more time, but People need to eat like three times a day, every day. It's just a lot. So just wanted to sort of end on just like how you're doing and any sort of last words um, and advice you have for the community. Um, who would like to start? Um, I will um, pick Becky, um, al you know, alphabetical order. Sure, happy to start. Um, oh, I, I, I think um, we all need to recognize that this isn't a natural scenario and that, um, you know, we shouldn't all be expected to be full-time parents, full-time everything all the time um, under this kind of stress. And um, But all of that said, um, we, I per personally, you know, I'm just recognizing the, the privilege of being healthy and, and being in a place where we can stay at home and um, do the things we need to do to stay healthy and keep our family healthy um, and en enjoy each other as much as we can um, and, and learn a little bit about resilience and resilience for ourselves and resilience for our children and resilience for our communities. So we're, we're trying to do that over here. Um, I'm also lucky that, that my wife is the chef and um, has started supplying us with all of the basic needs like bread and, um, 
groceries and vegetables in the garden and um, just lucky to have that support from family as well. That's great. Johnny, you wanna share a little bit? Yeah. Um, I like a lot of folks, uh, I'm actually working more than ever before. And often I'm spending 12 hours a day in a basement with a room without a window. Um, so I've been just really um, grateful for my family, being able to go take a break from work and go cook lunch, make lunch uh, for my family has been really great. Uh, I like the rest of the world, it seems, if uh, Instagram is any indication, have a really beautiful sourdough starter. Um, when flour became scarce, I started looking for local mills. And so I found a, a mill in Camas that makes like single varietal flowers. So I bought myself some fancy flowers that, uh, from weed I'd never heard of. And uh, I've been making things, waffles, croissants, bread. Uh, if it can be made with flour, I'm probably gonna try to make it right now. I don't even like bread, which is um, a hilarious thing. But uh, also in general, I make ginger beer uh, a lot. Uh, it's non-alcoholic. It only ferments for two days, but um, it's delicious. So I've been making like six liters at a time and putting it in jars and dropping it on people's porches. Um, the ginger beer fairy has, is what I am right now. And it makes me happy to like have a way to love my community, you know? That's wonderful. Thank you. Val? So, um, you know, I, I think like Johnny, I uh, am working even more, but, um, and even though we're social distancing with Zoom calls, it just feels like I'm on. And I think uh, Saturday, I, I just literally, I, I, I woke up at eight and just stayed in bed and read something because I just needed to be off. But like, three days in, this was five weeks ago, we, we really pushed to get everybody home. And as that from at Bowley and um, as the reality sort of settled in and my whole family's on the East Coast and, uh, and, it, and you know, many of them are, are, are healthcare workers or first responders or, you know, my mother and sister are, are in Florida with all that going on. And so I realized that if they got sick, I wasn't going to be able to be there. Um, I wasn't going to be able to go home. And I realized what was coming. And I, I laid down and just as I relaxed, I just started sobbing and cried myself to sleep. And I, um, the next day woke up and I'm like, I'm all stuffed up. I'm maybe I'm sick. And my husband's like, or you cried yourself to sleep. Maybe that happened. So um, I just, you know, I've been talking to my staff and reminding myself that this is really hard and sometimes it's harder to focus and we have to give ourselves a break. This isn't the same as working in your office, right? So we have to give ourselves a break. And so when I take phone calls, I walk up and down, you know, sort of my driveway, which is a hill. So um, I'm trying to get my steps in so that I can eat the food. I also like Becky, I'm married to a chef and my favorite thing that he's made makes is called ground nut stew. I think when Carol came the last time he made it. So very traditional African meal. My husband grew up in Africa and it is peanut stew and it's chicken and peanut butter and ginger and it's really good. So if you can get a recipe for it, it is great comfort food. And then I've just been talking to people about things and doing like little videos on Things like I talked to Ellen Rosenblum about civil rights and she shared uh, a, a Passover salad recipe. So I've been doing a couple of those a week. So check out my website and you can see different recipes because we're all sick of the same recipes and we need new recipes. So that's what I've been doing. And what I would say to everybody that's on this call is give yourself a break. You know, and I'm one of the lucky ones, but give yourself a break. This is really hard and um, support each other. And um, thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to everyone and know that our office is there and we're ready um, to help people any way we can.
Yeah, thank you for that. And it feels, um, yeah, really important. Just my takeaways from this call are, you can't be evicted, stay in your house, there is food available and bullies there to protect you. So um, feel really confident about um, the people who are working so hard every day to make sure that um, people's basic needs are met and you're not discriminated against and you get everything you need. So um, just really wanna appreciate that. And um, yeah, and we're gonna send out uh, links and all the information people um, will need from this call uh, and all the information that was shared um, in the coming weeks. And um, next week, Queer Town Hall will be focused on mental health and we will have some counselors and trauma-informed counselors um, on that call. Um, we might have a little meditation. Um, we're gonna really just try to ground ourselves because this is an extraordinary time and a really hard time. And I think that, um, you know, some of us may have started crying last night when we heard summer camp was canceled. Um, some of us being me, um, and um, yeah, it's it's a long stretch and realizing that this is still the beginning of, um, for a lot of us of being home with our kids um, or, and working. Um, so yeah, there's a lot happening, but um, we have amazing people in the state. Um, so thank you all for being on this call. I really appreciate it and I, um, hope everybody got the information they needed. You can always um, call or email us at Basic Rights Oregon too. So we will continue to share the information um, and our staff is busily working from home every day. So thank you all. And I hope everybody has a good night and I'm gonna share, um, maybe I'll put it on the Bro Facebook page, but banana tahini snack cake. It's a really great new banana bread, solid. Um, so thanks everybody and have a good night. Take care.